Well, if you're able to, can I suggest that you stand as we say the words on the screen together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, if you stood for that, do please take a seat. Uh, we're going to have our Bible reading now. It's from Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 23 to 48. If you've got a Bible to hand, do turn to it. Uh, Brenda Westbrook is going to bring our Bible reading to us again this week. Uh, last week, bless her, she read the whole of Acts chapter 10 for us. Uh, we only had the first half, and so I said, well, we would use the second half of that reading this morning. So Brenda's now going to read to us. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He's a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, that it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil. Because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him 
receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptised with water? They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way your Spirit met Cornelius and his household all those years ago. We pray that your Spirit would come and meet with us this morning. Speak to us, Lord, make us more like your Son. We ask this in his name and for his glory. Amen. Well, when C.S. Lewis, the author of the wonderful Narnia stories, was about six or seven, he was taken to France by his family. When they returned home to Belfast, where he grew up, his father asked if he enjoyed the trip. Lewis replied, I'm prejudiced against the French. His father, not unreasonably, asked, why? To which the precocious young Lewis responded, if I knew that, it wouldn't be a prejudice. We all have prejudices, whether we admit them or not, whether we're aware of them or not. As many of you will know, I'm part of a team in the diocese responsible for the selection of new vicars. And uh, last year, uh, as a team, we received some training in what's called unconscious bias. It's a nice way of basically trying to make us aware of our prejudices, the ones we didn't know we had, both the negative and the positive. Uh, the ones when somebody comes in uh, to see us who's quite like us, and we think, well, they're bound to be a wonderful vicar, but also the ones where actually they're rather different from us, and we think, well, they couldn't possibly be a vicar because they're so different to us. We all have prejudices, whether we're aware of them or not. It was the same 2,000 years ago. We saw last week how the Lord challenged Peter about his prejudice, not only over unclean food, but over his attitude to all things declared unclean by the Old Testament law. This week, we see Peter putting into practice what he had learnt, laying aside his prejudice and going to the Gentiles. So let's take a closer look. Having invited Cornelius' two servants and this devout soldier to stay overnight, the next day they set out for Caesarea, taking six Christians with them on that trip from Joppa, we discover in chapter 11. They either talk quite a lot or they're slow walkers because the journey Cornelius's, Cornelius's servants and that devout soldier took just took one day. But to get back uh, down to Caesarea, it took Peter and his companions two days. As they enter the house of Cornelius, he kneels at Peter's feet in reverence, but Peter refuses to accept such respect, which should only be offered to God. And I wonder if there are people we treat uh, with the respect which is really only due to God. There are people we give the reverence which we should reserve to God too. Perhaps we don't go that far, but perhaps there are people we put on a pedestal. And today is a good day to reflect on that and to think and to repent. But then in verse 27 to 29, Peter starts with a public renouncement of that prejudice. What I find amazing, though, is that Peter says, may I ask why you have sent for me? Now, Peter's had two nights and two days with these three servants of Cornelius, and yet he doesn't know why he is going. I don't know about you, but I find this quite a challenge. Last week, we heard how God spoke to Peter about his prejudice and the breaking down of those barriers. Do not call anything in impure that God has made clean, he was told. And we heard about how the Holy Spirit said to Peter, three men are looking for you. Do not hesitate to go with them, 
for I have sent them. And yet Peter has no idea why. I wonder if we had been in Peter's position, whether we would have been so obedient. Or would we have questioned God? Why, Lord? Where do they want me to go? What will I do when I get there? I think it's very easy to dress up disobedience as wanting more information, but I'm really struck and really challenged by the fact that Peter does what God asks him to. No ifs, no buts, no why, no where, no what, no wherefore, no do you really mean me? I wonder when God speaks to you, do you obey or do you ask for more information? Cornelius answers, answers Peter's question in verses 30 to 33. But in one sense, the, simple, the answer is simply, God told me to send for you, so I obeyed. Cornelius doesn't really know why Peter is there either. He has just been obedient to God as well. And so in verses 34 to 43, Peter puts into practice what he tells us in chapter 3 of his first letter. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope you have. What Luke records for us is, I'm sure, only a summary of Peter's address of his sermon. He starts declaring that God doesn't have favourites in verse 34. This isn't that God accepts everyone. This is not universalism where everyone is saved no matter what. Neither is God running a democracy where every view is equally valid. Rather, there is no ethnic or cultural or moral barriers to God's forgiveness and new life. This is not everyone will be saved, it is everyone can be saved. God accepts people from every tribe and every nation who fear God and do what is right. Peter then goes over the basic facts of the Christian faith, how Jesus died, uh, sorry, lived, died and rose again, as we've just affirmed in our creed. And then in verse 43, how those who believe in Jesus receive forgiveness of, the, of their sins. Friends, I think there's a, a common misconception about the Christian faith in our world, or certainly in our Western world, that being a Christian equals being good. But in verse 43, Peter makes it very clear what makes you a Christian. He makes it clear that it's nothing to do with being good, in inverted commas. Being good is simply an outworking of being a Christian. It's the outworking of loving God and loving our neighbour. Have you noticed that in Peter's speech it's all about God? About how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit? How he went around healing because God was with him? It was God who raised him from the dead. God had already chosen the witnesses. It's God who appoints the judge of the living and the dead. In fact, Jesus' name is hardly mentioned. It's mentioned just once. And then it's he, 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 God, God, God. And whilst Peter is still speaking in verses 44 to 46, God pours out his Holy Spirit. If you've done the Alpha course with us, you'll have heard me talking about how difficult it is to get a preacher to shut up and be quiet, and yet here the Holy Spirit manages it. In the same way, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. He anoints Cornelius and his household and his friends. He's invited to hear Peter with the Holy Spirit. God demonstrates the truth that Peter's already declared. God does not show favouritism. He pours out his Holy Spirit on these Gentiles. And so, having received the sign of the inward working of conversion, the receiving the sign of the Holy Spirit, the natural thing is for that outward working, that outward sign, that outward demonstration to occur. And so they are baptised. Friends, it's Peter's obedience to go and tell of what has God has done, coupled with God's pouring out of the Holy Spirit that brings Cornelius and his household to faith. Peter didn't do it on his own. And that's what these ten days of thy kingdom come, starting in the middle of this week, between Ascension and Pentecost, are all about. Asking God's kingdom to come, just as it came on Cornelius and his household. 
And so I'm going to finish this sermon, not with words from me, but with words from the Archbishop of York, John Sentaming, or John Sentaming, uh, talking about the way he has prayed, thy kingdom come, and the way he's seen that worked out in the lives of those he's prayed for. I encourage you to do the same over the coming weeks.